Now it is time for the last word with Jonathan Capehart, who's in for Lawrence. Good evening, Jonathan. I have heard Good that evening. you have a very, very big interview airing tomorrow night. Yes, um, the very big interview that will be uh, taped just hours before it airs. Uh, so tomorrow is going to be a very interesting but also exciting day seeing the president um, right after that Bafo State of the Union address. Yes, well, it's a huge get. We're all eagerly awaiting your interview and so excited for you and get your beauty sleep tonight after you finish the show. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> Have a great night. <laughs> Have a good evening. Good evening and welcome to the worst week of Donald Trump's life so far. Donald Trump's best hope of a get out of jail free card was Joe Biden losing the presidential campaign. Joe Biden is not losing the presidential campaign. No one knows what will happen in November, but the Biden reelection campaign is fired up and on offense. Joe Biden forcefully answered the pundits who say he is too old in his State of the Union last night. 32 million potential voters watched his speech, likely the biggest audience either presidential candidate will command before the conventions. The campaign announced it is rolling out a new $30 million TV ad blitz. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will visit all six battleground states this month, starting today. My lifetime has taught me to embrace the future. I mean it sincerely, freedom, democracy, a future based on the core values that have defined America, honesty, decency, fairness, equality, yeah. just treating people just fairly. No, I really mean it. We don't always live up, but that, that, that's the American creed. Donald Trump sees the story differently. He sees a story of resentment, revenge, retribution. I ask today, Arizona, are you ready to make your voices heard? Do we trust women? Do we believe in reproductive freedom? Do we believe in the promise of America? Are we ready to fight for it? And when we fight, we win. Joe Biden has a professional campaign operation. Joe Biden has the pomp and power of the presidency at his disposal. Joe Biden has money to spend on being reelected. And Donald Trump? Donald Trump watched every minute of the president's State of the Union. You know that because he was ranting all night on his janky social media site, including, he's so cra angry and crazy. Okay, old man, settle down. Donald Trump is angry about President Biden's speech, which the Biden campaign felt so good about, it immediately turned it into an ad. I know the American story. Again and again, I've seen the contest between competing forces in the battle for the soul of our nation. Between those who want to pull America back to the past and those who want to move America to the future. The issue facing our nation isn't how old we are, it's how old are our ideas? Hate, anger, revenge, retribution are the oldest of ideas. I see a future where defending democracy, we don't diminish it. I see a future where we restore the right to choose and protect our freedoms. Where the middle class has finally has a fair shot and the wealthy have to pay their fair share in taxes. I see a future where we save the planet from the climate crisis and our country from gun violence. I see a country for all Americans, and I will always be president for all Americans. So let's build the future together. Let's remember who we are. We are the United States of America. Donald Trump is angry because of these reviews. In your face, Biden takes on Trump and his own doubters. State of the Union shows there's life in the old boy yet. Biden electrifies Democrats, spars with Republicans in fiery State of the Union address. Biden silences the doubters. And so much for Sleepy Joe. 
Jonathan Alter, who has questioned whether Biden should run again, said today, quote, Biden proved that he has the strength, endurance, and mental agility to be an effective president. The president didn't just clear the senility bar, he demolished it. And here are the most important reviews. Voters in battleground states. We got a little pep in his step. You know, the uh, old school joke around Biden was there. And uh, it was good to see that he uh, is ready for this election. He clearly is totally with it. I just thought he nailed it. I saw energy and I loved his ad libbing. I just thought he punched back like he should have. He was powerful. He got his point across and he's doing a good job. He stood strong. He looked like a president. And uh, that's what we needed. I thought that um, Joe Biden, Uncle Joe, as I like to call him, came off very vivacious, which was important to him and important um, to everybody. I think President Biden delivered the strongest speech of his that I might have ever seen. Um, he, he, he came out swinging and, and he did not hold back. And, and, and I, I, I couldn't disagree with almost anything that he said. I would rather have a president with 81 years behind him than 91 counts ahead of him. I thought that Joe Biden was absolutely amazing. He stood up for himself. He stood up for decency, honesty, and for the American public. He was great. Super energetic, stayed organized, kept delivering punch after punch, saying things that I wanted to hear him say without being, you know, too combative. He delivered. He showed uh, that his uh, age is not going to be an issue for him. He has the mental capacity to engage anyone and answer questions on the spot. I think he did a great job. He, he made his point. He got across to a lot of people. I think he did a great job. I really do. He might be a little elderly, but he's sane and he's a kind man. The other one, he is old. He's old, too, but he's crazy and dangerous. Trump's old, too, but he's crazy and dangerous. That's it. That's checkmate. There is no issue, no question, no concern about Joe Biden, for which the answer is Donald Trump. Well, here we are, you guys. Donald Trump is now the presumptive GOP nominee for president, again, for a third time, despite the fact that he's a twice-impeached, four-time criminal indictee and racist who's been found liable for fraud and sexual abuse, banned from doing business in the state of New York for three years, owes over half a billion dollars in fine, took millions from foreign governments while he was president, tried to extort a foreign country to interfere in an election in 2020, and encouraged another to help him win in 2016, actively undermined the nation's response to a once-in-a-lifetime pandemic and let a deadly disease spiral out of control. It's about to go on trial for breaking campaign finance laws by paying hush money to cover up an affair during the 2016 campaign. Orchestrated a months-long coup attempt that culminated in a violent insurrection to disrupt the peaceful transfer of power and install him as an unelected dictator. Stole classified documents and obstructed attempts to get them back. Has never once won the popular vote and has been routinely rejected by a majority of Americans in election after election. Spews deranged conspiracy theories about everything from climate change to immigration to vaccines to windmills. Glitches on three-syllable words, two-syllable words, and one-syllable words. Cheats at golf. Can't spell his own name, his wife's name, or the words indicted, education, unprecedented, stolen Denmark, Kentucky, or tap. And is on top of everything else, the single weirdest and most off-putting human being on the face of the planet. And this is the same planet Ted Cruz lives on, so that's saying something. Donald Trump is finally being hoisted by his own petard. It will be pretty hard for the reality TV persona who shoved himself in Americans' faces for decades, including every tweet during his four years in office, to convince voters he's something else. And if the humiliation of President Biden's successful State of the Union wasn't enough today, Donald Trump finally had to pay. He posted a nearly $92 million bond for lying about sexually assaulting E. Jean Carroll. That is Donald Trump being punished. That is Donald Trump being held accountable. That is Donald Trump being bound by the law like everyone else. 
Yes, it's a bond, and he's in the process of appealing, but it marks the end of Trump's effort to delay, deny, and try to break the system to evade justice. And it's only the beginning. Just 17 days from today, the civil fraud judgment of $454 million plus interest comes due, coincidentally, perhaps poetically, the same day as his criminal trial is scheduled to start in New York. Donald Trump is showing voters he is angry and crazy every day. He is grubbing for money under the weight of civil judgments. And he just installed his daughter-in-law as the head of the Republicans' National Campaign Committee. 241 days until Election Day. Today was a very bad day for Donald Trump. But there are almost certainly worse days for him ahead. Joining us now, Tim O'Brien, senior executive editor for Bloomberg Opinion and author of Trump Nation. He's host of the Bloomberg podcast Crash Course. And Jennifer Rubin, opinion columnist at The Washington Post and host of The Green Room podcast. Both are MSNBC political analysts. Thank you both for being here, Tim. How do you think Donald Trump is feeling tonight about his future? Lonely, angry, anxious, petrified. Uh, he's dealing with forces he can't control, Jonathan. Um, we've talked about this before. You know, Donald Trump is not a sophisticated man. He is not an intelligent man, uh, but he is a student of celebrity, and he's been fascinated with it his whole life. It's how he thinks about himself. And I think he watched that State of the Union uh, understanding exactly what Biden was doing, which was rewriting the script the Republicans wanted him to follow when he walked in and gave that address last night, which was they thought he'd be a stumbling, demented, incapable old man. And instead, he came out uh, uh, with, a, with a light touch. He ad-libbed exactly when he needed to. He cornered the Republicans at least twice on policy issues off the cuff, and he cornered them with it. And I think that's why you saw this massive volume of tweeting from Trump, because in real time, he understood that Joe Biden was getting traction. And if Joe Biden had traction, that meant Trump has a long eight-month battle ahead of him. These are still early days. It's a long way to November. But Donald Trump's going to be traveling this road, um, dealing with, with uh, criminal and civil charges, uh, dealing with a, with a federal prosecution. Uh, he is not someone who is, has any self-control most of the time. He has a financial deficit in this campaign already. And, and, and he is, I think, already emotionally undisciplined. And, and, and that is going to continue to haunt him on the campaign trail. And everything he did last night was an indicator of that. I think he's the only viewer of the State of the Union who thought that Katie Britt did a great job after, uh, in the address that she gave after Biden was done. And if you sort of bookmark last night's event, which began with Marjorie Taylor Greene trying to, to coax a reaction from Biden, and instead she looked like a, a vendor at a baseball game ready to throw hot dogs and beers to anyone who had an order. And then you end with Katie Britt. Uh, who came across as like a Stepford wife. She was, uh, uh, I think, scary and disarming and uncomfortable. And, and Trump sees all that. He sees how the event is bookended, and he knows the star of that show was Biden, and it frightens him. You know, Jen, uh, uh, speaking of Marjorie Taylor Greene, um, and she, tr she challenged the president, as Tim pointed out, challenged the president and lost on national television. I how do you think Trump saw that? How did other Republicans feel about being associated with that? Well, Donald Trump always thinks he's the biggest bully in town. And we all know that to beat a bully, you punch him in the nose. And that's what Trump, that what Biden did over and over again. He did it with humor. He did it with uh, strength in his voice. He did it with a whole, uh, really, rewriting of the script, um, telling the story of his presidency and the mess that he was handed by uh, Donald Trump. And 
I would like to point out also that this is a punch in the nose of the media, who was basically carrying the Trump line for months now, who had written him off, wrote mm -hmm. story after story about how old he is, how he was going to lose, how he's out of it, how no one thinks the economy is going well. And really, there have been some lonely voices in the wilderness like mine saying, I think you've got this wrong. This is not the race. This is not Joe Biden. And I think Joe Biden uh, returned people People to reality. But I'm shocked, shocked, Jonathan, you didn't like that young lady in the remodeled kitchen. Wasn't this like a home remodeling show? Oh, this was politics? I didn't notice. But listen, that, oh not my God. to be more seriously, to be more oh. serious, this is also a huge problem for Donald Trump and the rest of the Republican Party. Not only have they stirred anger across the country on abortion, which is now a 60, 65 percent issue the other way, but with IVF, they have really expressed and explained just how radical and nuts they are. And I think they are backpedaling as fast as they can. They can't do it because Mike Johnson, who himself looked very weird last night, let's face it, um, won't say that, uh, you know, a fertilized egg is not a person. Um, therefore, the egg gets all the rights, the woman gets none of the rights. So they have a huge problem with women. They have a huge problem now that they have been identified as the party preventing a deal on immigration. That was going to be their mm -hmm. ace in the hole, right? Open borders, open borders. Well, I think Biden has turned that around. And lastly, he yeah. has labeled them as, as poodles of Putin, which they are. Um, you know, this is how you know how bad Senator Katie Britt was. Um, both I and Hugh Hewitt are in agreement. <laughs> he also thought yeah. she was terrible. Was so that's that how happened? I know. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, Jonathan, Tim, when, was the last time you and, when was the last time you and Hugh Go Hewitt ahead. were in agreement? Yeah. Um, uh, Rarely, no. rarely, and yet today we were <laughs> yeah. we were in agreement three we were in agreement three times. But Tim, let me get you on the the, the e. Jean Carroll situation here. He Trump had to post bond to pay e. Jean Carroll while he's begging the RNC to pay his legal bills. What does this tell you about his money situation, and how do you how do you think this factors into Trump's state of mind that he's finally being held accountable and has to get up off some cash? You know, there's this longstanding myth that Donald Trump was untouchable legally. Um, but that myth, like so many things in his life, had never really been tested. He had never walked up in front of uh, very muscular, robust federal and state investigations by prosecutors who were determined to hold him accountable. And, and he has, you know, at least four very serious and perilous judgments staring him in the face. On the financial side of it, he's scraping for money. Uh, there, there has been a, a, a widespread assumption that Donald Trump might have several hundred million dollars in cash at his disposal, but that was largely dependent on deposition testimony he gave in which he said he had $400 million. Uh, but Donald Trump never tells the truth. Uh, and, and, and famously, I think as Alaire Townsend once said, I wouldn't believe Donald Trump if his tongue was notarized. So the simple fact that people were believing that $400 million was there because he said it in the deposition, we're now realizing the money's not there. He's scrambling, and he has another judgment he's going to have to deal with, $450 million. Yeah, that other judgment is, whew, uh, I'm glad I'm not him, for a host of reasons. But $454 million is, is, is a big one. Um, Jen, real quickly, last thoughts, real quickly. Uh, first of all, I want to know why Chubb is giving him the money. I think the shareholders of Chubb should be very concerned. And secondly, um, when it comes to the $450 million, if he doesn't have that, and remember, he's been begging for a stay of that judgment, they're going to come after his building. So we will see the uh, perhaps the Letitia James Tower. Perhaps we will see uh, Mar-a-Lago in uh, E. Jean Carroll's hands. Um, this is really his worst nightmare, because he has maintained this myth of success and he's not successful. He's a loser. I mean, I think if you really want to send a message, I know there's a building on Fifth Avenue in 56th <laughs> Street that would just really just get to the heart of the matter. Tim O'Brien, Jen Rubin, thank you both very much for joining us tonight. Coming up. 
Donald Trump's half a billion dollars he owes after his losses in civil court. Will Trump be able to find a bond for the judgment in the New York civil fraud case? And how long will he be able to drag out the appeals process? That's next. E. Jean Carroll is one step closer to justice. Earlier today, Donald Trump posted a $91.6 million bond as part of his appeal of the civil defamation suit Carroll won against him in January. Trump had done everything he could to avoid ponying up, but in the end, he couldn't put it off any longer, submitting his bond with just three days to go before the deadline. The bond, which was issued by the federal insurance company, represents 110 percent of the damages Carroll won and would be returned to Trump if his appeal is successful. Judge Lewis Kaplan gave E. Jean Carroll and her team until Monday morning to file any opposition to the specifics of Trump's bond. On social media, Carroll called the news of the bond stupendous, writing that even though her attorney is, quote, strong enough to yank a golden toilet out of the floor at Trump Tower and toss it through the window, this bond saves Robbie the trouble of showing up with U.S. Marshals on Monday to do so. Robbie is Robbie Kaplan, her lawyer. With the bond in the Carroll suit secured, now all Trump has to do is come up with another bond for the $454 million verdict in New York Attorney General Letitia James's civil fraud suit against him. He has until March 25th to do that, which just happens to be the same day Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg's criminal hush money case against him is set to begin. Joining me now is Mark Zauderer. He is a veteran New York business lit litigator who has secured many appeal bonds. Mr. Zauderer, thank you very much for being here. Now that Trump has finally secured this bond, where does the process go from here? What happens if his, if his appeal is unsuccessful? Well, good to be with you, Jonathan. Um, it's a great day for bonding companies, as you're observing. So I think it's useful if I just give you a little context about what a bond is. A bond is simply a piece of paper that reflects a promise to pay. Think of it like a U.S. bond. The government promises to pay under certain conditions. And what's applicable here is a reputable bonding company has put up a bond which says, if this judgment is affirmed, we will pay it. And of course, we can talk about bonding companies are there to make money. And so they're not going to make that promise without adequate security from Mr. Trump. I mean, they could take 100 percent of the amount in cash, but that's not going to happen because if Trump had the cash, he wouldn't need a bonding company and wouldn't have to pay their hefty fees. So with the bond in place, and as you say, if the court accepts it in form on Monday, then all attempts that the Ms. Carroll might make to enforce the judgment will come to a stop. And actually, that would be a home run for Ms. Carroll, because if the judgment is affirmed on appeal, she won't have to worry about chasing Mr. Trump or Mr. Trump's assets. She can simply look to the bonding company, and then it's the bonding company's problem to be secure, to make sure that it can get compensated by Mr. Trump. Mm. We, we, oh, wow. We, we don't that's, know, that's know yet. The, right. We don't yet know the specific terms of Trump's bond. But given your expertise, how much do you <clears throat> think this bond is going to cost him? It's going to cost a lot. I mean, I think of it like going to a porn broker and say, I'd like $1,000. <clears> Excuse me. And uh, that's fine. Give me a Rolex watch, but it's going to cost you $200 up front. So maybe it'll be 5% of the amount of the bond. That's a negotiation between the bonding company and Mr. Trump. Now, if it's 5%, you can do the arithmetic in your head. That's a lot of money for a $91 million bond. So it's going to cost a lot of money. Uh, not not so easy. Uh, oh, OK. N now I get it. He he didn't hand over ninety one million dollars and this this bond company is holding it. He gave them a, per a little percentage of the ninety one million dollars. And if he loses the appeal, then he's got to he's got to find that money. I got that right. Right. Yeah. 
Well, well no, okay. uh, just about, but the, the bonding company will make out a check. The Carol lawyer will say, okay, bonding company, which is an insurance company, uh, he's lost the appeal. We would like a check for the full amount of the judgment with interest, maybe $90 million at that point. <clears throat> so it's the bonding company's right. problem to pay up, and it's the bonding company's problem to make sure it's secure, that has assets that it can realize on to get whole from Mr. Trump. Right. Right. I got it. I'm, fo I'm following. Now, uh, Mr. Zauer, Trump Good. cut it close in securing that bond. What do you think about his prospects of finding someone to help with his almost half a billion dollar appeal in the New York attorney general's case? I think he's going to have a lot of difficulty there. What he has offered the state court in that case is to pay, uh, uh, is to put a bond up for $100 million. Uh, he can't, he has not offered to put up the full amount of the Four hundred fifty or five hundred million dollars. Uh, he's got that issue before an appeals panel, which is going to get all the briefing within the next couple of weeks. Uh, and if the appeals panel says, "Sorry, uh, we want the full amount of the bond," then the attorney general will start making a run for Mr. Trump's assets. And she has said that publicly that that's what she intends to do. Because if he can't post the required amount of bond, then the attorney general is free to start her collection efforts uh, on the uh, $500 million judgment. Mark and she'll Zauer, go after his assets. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, ab thank you. absolutely. And that's going to that's gonna be a sad day for Mr. Trump if that, if that were to happen. Mark Zauer, thank you very much for coming to The Last Word. And joining me now, Paul Butler. Professor of Law at Georgetown University and former federal prosecutor. He is an MSNBC legal analyst. Paul, thank you, uh, as always, for being here. With, with special counsel Jack Smith's cases against Donald Trump getting either ground to a halt during immunity appeals or bogged down by the judge in the classified documents case, does Carroll's case show there are still ways to hold Trump accountable? Uh, you bet. It does, Jonathan, because guess what Trump has not done since he got whacked with that $84 million verdict? He has not defamed E. Jean Carroll. He quit lying about her because he knows if, she, if he does, she's going to slap him with another defamation lawsuit. So going bankrupt seems to scare Trump more than going to prison. Yeah. Do, do you think Trump will be successful on appeal in either overturning the judgment or lowering the penalty? Uh, no, he won't be. There's this myth, as we heard from your earlier guest, that Trump beats his court cases. He's successful at delay, but when judgment day comes, he loses all the time. He lost to E. Jean Carroll in the defamation case. Uh, he lost to Letitia James in the civil fraud case. Uh, he lost his case involving his fake university and the case involving his fake charity. So I don't think he's going to be successful uh, in part in the civil fraud case because he had such a lousy lawyer representing him. But again, he's often just wrong on the merits. Paul Butler, as always, thank you for joining us. Okay. Coming up. The fact that the presumptive Republican presidential nominee owes a half a billion dollars in civil judgments and has an affinity for dictators should be a national security concern. That's next. Now my predecessor, a former Republican president, tells Putin, quote, do whatever the hell you want. That's a quote. A former president actually said that, bowing down to a Russian leader, I think it's outrageous, it's dangerous, and it's unacceptable. My message to President Putin, who I've known for a long time, is simple. We will not walk away. We will not bow down. Down. That was President Biden last night drawing a stark contrast with Donald Trump. And Vladimir Putin isn't the only autocrat Donald Trump seems to be bowing down to these days. 
Donald Trump hosted Hungarian strongman Viktor Orban a few hours ago at Mar-a-Lago, just days after Prime Minister Orban said that the only chance for peace in Ukraine is if Donald Trump returns to power. Viktor Orban told an economic forum on Monday, quote, it is not gambling, but actually betting on the only sensible chance that we in Hungary bet on the return of President Trump. In 2022, the European Parliament announced that Hungary can no longer be considered a full democracy. So the fact that Hungary is betting on the return of Donald Trump should scare you. And the fact that Donald Trump is on the hook for nearly half a billion dollars in civil judgments should really scare you. Why? This is what the former head of the Justice Department's National Security Division told Time Magazine four years ago. Quote, for a person with access to U.S. classified information to be in massive financial debt is a counterintelligence risk because the debt holder tends to have leverage over the person and the leverage may be used to encourage actions that compromise U.S. national security. Joining us now, David Rothkopf, foreign affairs analyst and columnist for The Daily Beast. He is also the host of the Deep State Radio podcast. David, great to see you. Thank you for being here. B Viktor Orban is often seen as Putin's closest ally among European, uh, European Union leaders. Where is Orban on Russia's invasion of Ukraine? Well, uh, he's sort of been on both sides of the issue, but the point that you made just at the outset there is the most important one. He, like Trump, wants the issue settled. Trump has said he could settle it in a day. Of course, the only way you settle it in a day is you say, OK, Vlad, we're going to give you whatever you want. I think that's what Putin wants. Uh, that's what Orban wants. Uh, and that's what, you know, all that cluster uh, on the global right seems to be aiming for here. They're betting Trump can come in and hand Ukraine or a chunk of it over to Putin. David, listen to what President Biden said in Pennsylvania today, criticizing Donald Trump for that meeting with Orban today. Orban of Hungary, who stated flatly he doesn't think democracy works, he's looking for dictatorship. The only member of NATO, that's who he's meeting with. I see a future where we defend democracy, not diminish it. I see a future. David, President Biden, right there, once again, describing Donald Trump as a threat to democracy. Yeah, well, I, you know, I think the striking thing last night about the State of the Union was right out of the gate. President Biden compared this moment to the moment in, in, the, in the early 40s when we faced the Nazis, the greatest fascist threat we've ever faced. And he made a direct connection to the threat from Trump and the threat from those fascists 80 years ago. Uh, he didn't pull any punches on that. And I think, you know, this is the first week of the campaign, right? We had Super Tuesday, then we had the State of the Union. And within 24 hours, what have we seen? We've seen Biden. Biden say, I'm going to fight for democracy. I'm going to stand up against my opponent who supports Trump. And we've seen Trump embrace Viktor Orban, one of Putin's errand boys. And last night, the other thing is, and I again, you couldn't see it really in your clip there, was that the Republicans sat on their hands when Biden said things that, you know, would have been, you know, cause for everybody to stand up and applaud, like, I'm going to stand up for democracy. I'm going to stand up to, for Russia. They, you know, were quiet. Why? Because that's what Putin, that's what Trump, and that's what that entire movement wants them to be right now. David, are you worried about Trump's money problems? Well, of course. I mean, there's a bit of schadenfreude in enjoying Trump's money problems. But certainly, if Trump were anybody else going for any other job in the United States government, and he had those money problems, or he had his history with classified information, or he had his history of taking money from dubious foreign sources, even when he was president— He'd never get a classified clearance in the United States government. Uh, and the thought that somehow he's going to be put back in a position where he can override all of that, 
once again have access to classified information, and he's going to be on the hook for a big chunk of money, and he's not going to be able to get it from the usual sources, that should be a cause for everybody to be concerned. David Rothkopf, as always, thank you very much for coming to The Last Word. Thank you. Coming up, one thing on the ballot this fall, do you want a president whose policies will make life lives better for millionaires and billionaires, or a president who's working to do everything he can to make college more affordable for everyday folks across the country? That's next. Wall Street didn't build America. They're not bad guys. They didn't build it, though. The middle class built the country. When America gets knocked down, we get back up. We keep going. That's America. When I was told I couldn't universally just change the way in which we did, dealt, dealt with student loans, I fixed two student loan programs that already existed to reduce the burden of student debt for nearly 4 million Americans, including nurses, firefighters, and others in public service. Last night, during his State of the Union, President Biden pointed to yet another campaign promise he's delivered on. His latest effort to re reduce student debt includes a $1.2 billion plan giving relief to 150,000 Americans. The plan will wipe out loans worth up to $12,000 for those who've been making payments for at least a decade. The president's been quietly working to provide rounds of debt relief after the Supreme Court's conservative majority struck down his original plan for giving $400 billion in student loan debt for more than 40 million Americans. Our next guest, Jessica St. Paul, a physician's assistant and community college educator, calls the loan forgiveness granted to her by President Biden, quote, life-changing. After taking out $95,000 in loans for college and then both a master's and, PhD, and a PhD, her balance ballooned to nearly $150,000. Now she owes nothing. Working for more than 25 years on a public servant's salary, Jessica says her loan payments reached $1,200 a month. She says that kept her from starting a family, buying a home, and saving for retirement. Her debt now forgiven, she's continuing her passion for public service and encouraging others to do the same in their schools and communities. Jessica St. Paul introduced President Biden at a recent event advocating for student loan forgiveness in Culver City, California. This freedom, this breathing room, is because of President Joe Biden. And just two weeks ago, I had my baby girl. moment for me to live my dream of being a mom because President Biden has the back of hardworking Americans, public servants just like me. I can invest in my retirement, secure a brighter future for my daughter. It is with great honor and gratitude to introduce to you our President Joe Biden. Yes. Yes, the baby's new. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Jessica St. Paul, a physician's assistant and adjunct professor of public health at Los Angeles Southwest College. As we mentioned, she recently had nearly $150,000 of student loans forgiven. Jessica, welcome to the show. Congratulations on the, on the new baby. We don't have time for you to show me a little picture, because I usually make people show me pictures of, uh, of the kids. But let's listen to more of President Biden's State of the Union address. Such relief is good for the economy, because folks are now able to buy a home start a business, start a family. While we're at it, I want the public school teachers a raise. So, so Jessica, we, we have a chart here showing the breakdown of the president's student loan, student debt relief, and who's been helped. It's nearly $140 billion and nearly 4 million people. And that now includes, that now includes you. Tell us how you found out your loan was forgiven and how it's affected your day-to-day -day life. 
Well, actually, for me, because I've been working with the American Federation of Teachers since 2018, and just a year after when the um, when our union actually uh, sued then Secretary DeVos um, for the mismanagement of public service loan forgiveness, and I saw that there are different changes for public service loan forgiveness, I knew then at that time, because of the time that I've been in public service, that my loans would be forgiven. So when you were when I received the letter, it was an email um, from at that time the loan servicer Mohila um, got the email. I didn't believe it. I had to call, had her email it to me. <laughs> I then printed it out and framed it, and I knew at that moment that my loans were going to be forgiven. So all the work that we've done over the past years and having this administration um, uh, relieve the public service loan forgiveness program to relieve, relieve that debt for me was just amazing. It just changed my life forever. Yes. Jessica, what would you say to politicians who oppose this kind of debt relief? You know, I will always say that, remember, this is a bipartisan, especially for public service loan forgiveness, this was bipartisan, it was a bipartisan Congress, you know, with, with George Bush. And so this is, a, we're asking everyone that, think about our public servants. These are our teachers, our nurses, our firefighters, you know, policemen. These are individuals who commit their life to public service. So when you're thinking about different policies, and remember these individuals who saved our lives. I mean, we're thinking about with this long-term economic impact of the pandemic and people are going out of public service, we're here. We're here to continue to serve, and we just need this opportunity for us to get the public service loan forgiveness promise that we had, mm -hmm. um, which has happened under this administration, which is truly amazing and changed millions of lives of Americans. And after everything you've been through, what's your message to those who aspire to work in public service? You can do this. Um, the public service loan forgiveness have, program has been fixed. It's no longer broken. That's why elections matter. Take the opportunity. It doesn't matter what you do. It's who you work for and where, you, where you're employed. Please continue to work in public service because we have community members who are ready for you. We know when this happened during the pandemic, this will never happen without first responders, our teachers, our educators, you know, our nurses, PAs, MDs, everyone within public service. So I said, continue the service that you do and the public service loan forgiveness promise will happen under this administration. Jessica, since this has happened, how have you been able to treat yourself in some way, big or small, that you couldn't before your loans were for forgiven? Well, for me, it's my family. Um, we've been able to have my baby girl. I've always wanted to be a mommy. Um, you know, I had very amazing parents. And so for me, I've always wanted to have that legacy. And so having my daughter is the biggest thing in my life that has been able to happen. And I can still continue working in public service. So they're like, that's how you treated yourself with having a child? Yes, having my family was a treat for me. Um, and it's been amazing since this time. And so it's just really good that I can continue to work and continue to serve uh, my community. So I'm just extremely happy and forever grateful. Oh my God, I'm smiling ear to ear because your happiness is just jumping through the screen. Real quick, what, what's your baby girl's name? Sana Marie. Well, wait, Phenomery? Sanamari, S-A-N-A-A, Sanamari. Ah, ah, Sanamari, Sanamari. Yes. She's going to be proud of her mom when she, when she finds out who she is. Jessica St. Paul, thank you for coming thank to you. The Last Word. We'll be right thank back. You. Tomorrow, I will sit down with President Biden for an exclusive, unprecedented behind-the-scenes interview following this, following this week's State of the Union address. It's happening in Battleground, Georgia. You can see my exclusive interview right here tomorrow on The Saturday Show at 6 p.m. Eastern on MSNBC. That is tonight's last word.